Uniform circular motion is an interesting topic of mechanics. It doesn't actually teach us any new physics, but it helps us to understand the physics that we do know and the mechanics and the kinematics that we already know better. Uniform circular motion is when an object travels at a constant speed in a circular path. So the speed is constant. From that we can see that the velocity is not constant because velocity is a speed and a direction. The direction is constantly changing. Since the direction is changing, the velocity is changing, therefore there must be an acceleration. How can we quantify the acceleration when the speed is constant? It's an interesting question, and we'll be able to answer it by analyzing uniform circular motion. To change the direction without changing the speed of an object obviously requires a force because a force is what's required for an acceleration. But what kind of force is this? What are the properties of the force that causes uniform circular motion? And also, what other consequences can we find for a change in direction without a change in speed? To get a first idea of how this works, here we'll have two objects, A and B. We imagine them as uniformly rolling balls. They start off with the same speed, moving in the same direction, so they have the same initial velocity. They're going to contact these semicircular guides. A contacts one that's got quite a larger radius than B. And as they are moving in that circle, the directions of their velocities are changing. So which one is going to be accelerating most in the curve? We can think about this conceptually by keeping in mind what acceleration means. Acceleration is a rate of change of velocity. So it's the change in velocity, delta v, divided by the change in time, delta t. In this case, a and b both reverse their velocity. So that's a big change in velocity. a takes more time to do it because it's doing it over a larger circle. It takes longer to divert, it takes longer at the same speed to traverse the longer circle than to traverse the smaller circle. So b changes its velocity just as much as a, but in a shorter time. Therefore, b has a greater acceleration. Let's look at a somewhat different situation here. Now our situation is that A and B are standing on identical turntables. They're the same distance from the center, so they have the same radius. But they have different speeds. B is moving faster than A. So which one is accelerating the most? Well, again, in every half cycle, the velocity reverses. However, it has a bigger velocity, so that's a bigger change. So that's a bigger delta V. Also, since B is spinning faster, it reverses its velocity in a shorter time. So there's no contest. B has the greater acceleration by far than A because B has a greater velocity to reverse, a greater change in velocity, and B also has a shorter time in which to change it. So here's some of the characteristics of uniform circular motion. As I defined before, it's a constant speed in a circular path. As it turns out, the component of acceleration in the direction of velocity, that's what I'm referring to here as A parallel, is zero because the speed's not changing. The component of acceleration perpendicular to the velocity is all of it. To change the direction but not the speed, you have to apply a force that's perpendicular to the velocity. So what is this actual vector? We understand that the direction is crosswise to the path, but what's the actual magnitude and what's the actual direction because crosswise could be either direction. The direction is always toward the center of the turn. That makes sense if you think of initial and final velocities as you move around the circle. It's always changing in the direction toward the center of the turn. The magnitude, it turns out, has a very simple formula. It's the square of the speed divided by the radius of the turn. So that's v squared over r. v I refer to as the tangential speed. That's basically how fast the object is moving along its circular path, and r being the radius of the turn again. This helps us to understand our second case here where we had the two turntables a and b. The v squared term shows up because b has both a bigger velocity to reverse, that made the delta v bigger, and the smaller time in which it reversed, which made the delta t smaller as you increase the speed. That has a double effect in increasing the acceleration, both because it's increasing the numerator of the acceleration and decreasing the denominator. So now we'll ask about yet a different scenario. We have A and B on the same rigid disk. They're at different radii, different distances from the center. So how are their accelerations going to compare? With the expression v squared over r, we understand that a smaller radius makes for a higher acceleration, but a bigger velocity also makes for a higher acceleration. So here B has the smaller radius, but A has the higher velocity. From the expression v squared over r, that might be somewhat confusing to tease out. Here's another way we can look at it. 
In the same time, in every half cycle, both A and B reverse their direction. However, A has a higher velocity, so it has a bigger numerator, the delta V, with the same denominator, delta T. So A has to have the higher acceleration. We can also understand that from the formula V squared over R, tangential speed and the radius increase proportionately when you have the same angular speed. The V squared term goes up faster than the R term, so the greater speed more than outweighs the larger radius. There's another way to think about this, though, that doesn't require quite so much mental gymnastics, and that's to express the formula in terms of angular speed. So we'll look at it in rotational rather than in tangential terms. So here what we'll look at is the period of rotation, t, or equivalently, the frequency of rotation, which is the reciprocal of the period. So the period is how long it takes to make one rotation. The frequency is how many rotations you make in a unit time. So t would be in units of seconds per cycle. f would be in units of cycles per second. So here I'll develop these equations at the same time. Looking at it this way, the speed is how long the object takes to traverse a certain distance. Convenient distance would be one circumference of the circle. The amount of time it takes to do that is one cycle. So the speed, then, we can think of as 2 pi r, that's the circumference of the circle, divided by t, the period. Since the frequency is 1 over t, that's equivalently expressed as 2 pi r times f, the frequency. Well, then we can just substitute that formula for v into our previous formula, v squared over r, for the acceleration. When we're looking at it in terms of the period, we have v squared over r becomes 4 pi squared r squared over t squared r. We see that's almost as simplified as we can get. However, we have factors of r in the numerator and the denominator that we can cancel out. The same thing happens on the right, where we're looking at v squared over r in terms of frequency. And again, we have factors of r in the numerator and the denominator that can cancel out. And on this last line, we show that cancellation. If we're looking at it in terms of the period, then we have acceleration is 4 pi squared r over t squared. If we're looking at it in terms of the frequency, we have the acceleration is 4 pi squared r f squared. That might be a little confusing. Let's look at this formula to say what it's telling us. The centripetal, that means toward the center, acceleration, 4 pi squared r over t squared, gets bigger the farther you get away from the center, and it also gets bigger as the period of rotation gets smaller. Or if we're looking in terms of frequency on the right-hand side, the centripetal acceleration gets bigger as the radius increases, and it also gets bigger as the frequency increases. The frequency dependence is a square, so as you increase the frequency, the acceleration goes up a lot.